we sing about and we believe in the amazing grace of God. And then as people watch our lives, they're trying to decide whether or not God exists and what God is like and, and whether we really believe in God or not by how we live. And so if we live out our lives as an expression of grace and that love of God, then, uh, then people may begin to believe, well, wait a second, maybe I could expect that God would be loving and, and grace-filled and um, somehow uh, care about me. And, uh, and I love that. And so that song reminds me of that. It lines up exactly with something we're going to be talking about today in terms of expectations in general. Uh, I'm starting a new sermon series on expectations, but that does not mean that w- that which we have already talked about for the weeks coming up to today, you can just forget about, right? You're not allowed to forget it, you know? Uh, it's not going to be on the test next week, but that doesn't mean you can forget about it. Um, we talked about in the book of Acts how God's Spirit was sent by Jesus after he had died for our sin and raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. His Spirit came upon the first believers and followers in Jesus, and that continues to this day. So as you interact with other people that love the Lord and are, are seeking to praise him, and, and Bernie's a great example of that, and Lily's a great example of that, and so if you think about the folks that were up here, all right, if you ask either one of them to pray for you, will they pray for you, yes or no? And it would not be a bad idea to talk to them about that, because they love the Lord, and they're going to extend God's grace and love to you, and... Uh, and, you know, one might play to you and one might sing to you. I mean, what a deal, right? You know, right after the service, you may be like, look, I need that grace of God. We're all seeking to live like that. We learned about that in the book of Acts, but now I want to get into some, some different aspects of our life that um, can be roadblocks or they can be launching pads, depending on how we approach them. And, and one of the essential things that, that I've learned Ah, man, we've got to really settle is what can, what's a realistic expectation for that thing or that person? So for instance, um, if we in our relationships, when we get married, if the husband expects that the wife is going to cook all the food and do all the dishes and she's going to be obsessed about pleasing the husband with, with those things to the point that the husband is like, well, it's our wedding night. Um, I expect that my now bride is thinking, wow, what can I fix him for breakfast tomorrow? If that's your expectation, you know, that sets a certain tone for, for the marriage, right? You know, um, if when you have a, a, a child, if you expect that it's going to be silent night, holy night, because that's what the song declares Jesus' birth was like, right? It was just, you know, so every kid's going to be like that. Um, If we expect certain things and then they don't come to pass, we have a lot of disappointment in life. But if our expectation matches that which happens, or if that which happens even exceeds our expectations, then you may end up with a lot of joy. If you expected to get a bike at Christmas and you got an even better bike than you could picture in your head, that Christmas was pretty awesome, right? Yeah! If you expected to get a bike and you got a book about bicycles, you're like, what? Right? I mean, you're just like, ah! So if God, who knows all, could somehow help us set our expectations, wouldn't that be a pretty amazing life? Wouldn't that be a great life? You know? So that, so that God then is, is setting us up for joy and for wonderful success and and freedom and love and all those good things. So these expectations that we have, if God then were to tell us what's going to happen between the cat and the fish, and then it happened, we'd be like, oh, okay. We'd be ready for it, you know? It'd be interesting. So let's go specifically to, like, what I think would then be the most important person or thing that we have to get straight on our level of expectation, and that person would be God. You know, let's start there. Because if our expectations of God match up with what God really wants us to expect of God, then chances are it's going to help our lives. If they don't line up, then we may be forever frustrated, mad at God, or disappointed, or somehow frustrated. So as we start with God, I think we could start asking questions of God, like the ones around that particular picture, 
you know? Can I expect that God's going to fulfill my prayers my way, my way? Or is perhaps God's way of fulfilling my prayers sometimes different than my way? You know? Can I expect that God is always going to make sense to me? That's the one, you know? I'm always going to understand God perfectly. I'm like, is that a realistic expectation of God? Can I expect that God's going to protect me from everything that's bad? That's across the bottom. And so as we start thinking about this, I started thinking then, you know, we could ask those questions all day, every day, but there's an even more fundamental, basic question that I think would be helpful for us to answer right at the very beginning of this series. And that question is, can I expect to understand God? Because all those other questions rested on that question, didn't it? If I can expect to understand everything that God does, then when something happens, I should be able to to completely figure it out and be like, "Uh aha, I know exactly what God's doing because I can perfectly understand God. But interestingly enough, God reveals some things to us about God's self, but not all things, which should not be a surprise to us if we understand, first and foremost, that God's our creator. So let's just start there for a second. If you were to say, what is God, who is God, and you were to look it up in a dictionary, it's probably a good chance that the the, the dictionary entry is going to say something about God is that being that created everything else. So let's just start there for a second. Because at the very beginning of the Bible, when you turn to the very first page, the very first line, it says, in the beginning, Nathan created the heavens and the earth. (laughs) No, that's not what it says, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Even if you haven't read a Bible, you knew that's probably where we were going. So God created. So, okay, let's just start there. If that then is our starting point in understanding God, that means that God is an uncreated being and we are created beings. Because the Bible doesn't reveal and we've never figured out if if there was something that created God, you know, that that would then make God not God. So God is the creator, we're the created beings. Can a created being understand a non-created being? I guess would, my guess would be no. Like, I can't even picture in my mind what an uncreated being exactly would be like, right? Because anything I picture could be created, including, I I could just have a picture of it in my mind. An uncreated being, my goodness, that's so different from me. So if I were to say, can I expect to understand God, the immediate answer would be no. No, I can't expect to understand God. Writers in the Bible whose writings then others said, this is truly godly or somehow inspired by God or somehow helps us, like Isaiah's writings, declare this very thing. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. We can only picture like little, little glimpses of what that kind of being would be. He will not grow tired or weary, you know, like a four-year-old child who will wear you out, right? But yet God's not like a four-year-old child, right? God's way bigger than that, but would never get tired. That's the kind of being that God is, would never get weary. That's the kind of being the Creator is. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, I bet some of you that were raised in Sunday school have heard these these verses before. God inspires Isaiah to declare, this is on God's behalf, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Which remind me of the old gospel song by Taylor Swift, you know, we will never, ever, ever understand each other. I know that's not what it says, but I, that's what I was thinking of. You know, if you start thinking of that song, never, ever, 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 we are never going to understand each other. That's me and God on one hand. Now, God may understand me, but me completely understanding God, not going to happen. God's ways are higher. God's thoughts are higher. God's the creator. I'm not. That helps us to make sense of the book of Job in the Bible. There's a book of the Bible whose entire set of chapters revolves around a dialogue and an experience where God is allowing horrible things to happen to Job. And Job doesn't understand. 
And Job expects to understand because he's a holy guy. He's been worshiping God. You know, maybe he's got some of the scriptures there. And he's, he's like, look, I, I think I understand God enough to know that God cares and God is loving. But God is letting my children die. And God is letting me waste away and me have a horrible skin disease that is just excruciatingly painful and itchy. And I just feel like I just want to die. And he's, Job starts yelling at God, why? Why are you letting this happen? Where are you? Why are you doing this? The only way that that makes sense is if Job expects to understand. If you ask God why, then that, that would assume that we would be able to understand. But we just talked about the fact that sometimes we're not going to understand. Because God is way higher and his thoughts are totally different and higher than ours. And yet Job... Is, is saying exactly what I've said before, what you said. Why? What, what's going on? Why? And he's shaking his fist maybe at God. In the midst of all that, then God answers. And knowing now what we could expect of God, this is not a surprise. God's answer then comes from, in Job 38, Job 38 verse 1, the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Huh. Now wait a second. You know, if we think of God as only like a little teddy bear and we expect God to interact with us like a teddy bear with big brown eyes and cute little ears and stuff, like that's not who God is, right? <laughs> God's the creator of everything. God's the creator of the universe. So there comes a point at which our accusations that God is not good or that God doesn't make sense or that, you know, we're just mad at God, there comes a point at which when God comes in the room, everybody just kind of shuts up and is like, whoa, wait a second, I was out of line. Maybe you had a, a loving parent that was like that, you know, a mom or dad or both, or maybe when grandma or grandpa came into the room and you'd been acting up, and you'd, be, you'd been a little smarting off, you know, a little, little of this, a little of that. And then they came into the room. Mm-hmm. You're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And all of a sudden, we, we were quiet. Now, to an extent, God is like that. To an extent, it really helps us, even in times of crisis, to step back and say, wait a second, who am I really mad at? And how big is God? And how great is God? So, jo so Job's response back to God at this point, in chapter 40, Job replies to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever have the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. Now that's pretty powerful because Job thought that Job needed the answer why answered in a way that he could understand. But at this moment in time, he couldn't fully comprehend it. And even if God would have explained the answer, it would not have completely helped Job. Job needs to know that he's not alone, that God has not forgotten about Job, and Job needs to be reminded of and experience the power and majesty of God and God's presence. Then Job has more peace. God could have come in and said, hey, I'm allowing Satan to do all this horrible stuff to you so that you'll be an example to other people of great faith. Maybe that would have made Job feel better, but I don't think so. Because if God came and told me, look, I allowed all your kids to die and I allowed you to get a horrible, horrible terminal disease to show off your faith, I think I would say, God, you know, you could leave me alone and just do that to Pastor Phil. <laughs> right? I mean, just, you know, yeah, and Pastor Phil's like, no, 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 you know, God, why don't you do that to Jim behind me, right, you know? I mean, you, you see what we're talking about, right? Just because you know the answer to a why question, that doesn't necessarily make you feel better. I've seen people obsess about why did that person get that disease, and they're trying to figure all this out, and I'm like, you're still going to have the hole in your heart that that person's gone, yeah, you know, figure that out. That's going to be fine. That's good. But what you need is a presence of God. You need God to just overwhelm you with God's presence. And that's what God did for Job. And Job was like, oh, okay. And then God starts putting Job's life back together and healing Job and helping Job. 
And at that point on, then, Job has a better relationship with God because he has experienced the power of God's majesty, the vastness of God's, of God's knowledge. When God is talking to Job, he says things like, I created the donkey and the eagle and the ostrich and the whale. What have you created? Can you, Job, make the stars move around or make the earth? Can you do any of that, Job? And Job's like, no, I can't do any of that. So one way then for us to get at this idea of what can we expect of God, we can know and expect that God wants to help us to experience God's presence, but we're not always going to understand. What we can receive then is an experience of God's greatness, God's power, and God's presence with us. One way to do that is to pray by focusing in on creation, because that's kind of the way the book of Job expresses that Job started to experience God when God starts pointing out how powerful and amazing God must be to create all of these wonderful things in nature. So let me lead you in a prayer. And this is one that you could do even if you're laying in in bed at night or if you're sitting at your desk at work and you just start feeling overwhelmed. And I did this a couple of nights ago and I was just starting to feel really overwhelmed in in the nighttime. And I started praying something like this. And I'm telling you what, Sometimes God's going to really show up when you do this, okay? It's pretty powerful. Um, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead us in prayer by pointing out the creation that God has created. And I think for some of you, that will help you to experience God's presence right here, right now, okay? So here we go. I invite you to pray with me and just kind of think of the things that I mentioned, okay? God, our creator, I ask that you would help us to experience your presence right now. And I expect that for many of us here, we will be able to sense your presence by focusing in on what you have created, nature around us, the creation. And so God, we're all experiencing that natural force that is so mysterious called gravity. (laughs) We can't even understand how it is that we are being pulled to the ground by this force that you created called gravity. We're not floating up around the room because you have created a force of gravity that's pulling us down. And the atoms in our feet and in our legs that are are hitting then the floor or the pews, those atoms are hitting the pew atoms and the floor atoms and they're pushing against our body And as those forces are colliding, you're giving us stability where we can sit and we can stand because of this nature that you have created, the natural world, this this force of gravity that you came up with. And here we are, we're spinning around on this revolving thing that we call earth and we're moving a thousand miles an hour, spinning. (laughs) Lord, it doesn't feel like we're going a thousand miles an hour, but we know that that's true. And yet you're giving us this firm foundation here because of gravity. You came up with this. It was your idea. And then we're moving and hurtling through space around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. Lord, we broke the speed limit today when we were coming to church going 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. We're traveling that right now, but you came up with this idea. You created it. You're so powerful. And God, when we think of the stars that we'll see tonight, maybe 300 billion stars out there, more than we can ever see, that's just in our galaxy. And then God, here we are floating in this space, on this earth, in the midst of billions of galaxies, each with those galaxies having billions of stars. You came up with that. It was your design. You are that creative and powerful. And yet, here you are with us. We are in awe. Amen.
How great is your God now? You think about that. How great is your God? As people contemplate that, there are those that don't like Christians and don't like the church that will say, you all talk about God being loving, but when I study nature, I think it's a toss-up. Maybe God is loving, maybe God isn't, because God allowed a bunch of different things to have freedom in this world that operate by natural laws that then bring about horrible things. An earthquake happens, a hurricane comes, the tornado comes. We can study nature and understand how it is and why it is that those things occur, but then it, it, it raises the other question, why would God allow that? And it's interesting because we Christians, we're not burying our heads in the sand and ignoring those things. In fact, all of us experience them. We all experience our bodies wearing out or our friends dying or, or some, some big difficulty that happened, you know, because, you know, a tree fell or, or the hurricane came or something like that. And, you, and we start asking these very same questions that non-Christians ask. So how is it then that we could possibly say that a God that created this stuff that can happen is loving? How can we say then that God is loving? Well, we could say that if... God breaks into our hearts and our lives and somehow reveals that. Because just looking at nature, it's kind of a toss-up. If anything, you may say, ah, maybe God isn't loving because God allows tremendous amounts of freedom, both in the natural world, you know? If I go around a, a hungry lion and I jump in the cage and I'm like poking him with a stick, there's a good chance the lion's going to have me for breakfast, right? Is it because God doesn't like me? No, it's because I'm stupid and there's freedom in the world and the, and the lion is, is hungry. But if we think about that, well, what kind of God would allow that to be? Well, it's a God that allowed a ton of freedom, both in the natural world and in the human world. There's a friend of mine in Texas who, as a little girl, had such horrible things happen to her that when she was revealing that in a, in a little group of future ministers and I was trying to help lead them as, 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 as a teacher for them, as she's revealing those things, I wanted to go back in time and beat down the guys that had done those things to her. Does that make sense? Have you ever experienced that where you hear somebody's story and you're like, send me back in a time machine, man, and I'm going to take care of that. The amount of freedom that God has given humans to do good or to do evil, I can't understand, right? That's beyond me. It's amazing how powerful, how, how powerful God is that God would still limit God's self to say, I'm going to allow that amount of freedom. So the only way that I understand that God really is loving is if God breaks into this and shows and reveals somehow that God is loving. Interestingly enough, God has done that so powerfully that one of his disciples, John, wrote in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. How would he possibly have the audacity to say not only is God loving, but God is love, that God's very character is love. How would John know that? And the answer is because he saw God reveal God's self in Jesus. He saw Jesus. And John was absolutely obsessed with the idea that Jesus was both God and human together in the flesh. John described Jesus as the Word of God made flesh. God dwelt among us. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus his son to die for us and take on all of this hurt and sin on himself, destroy it, absorb it, set us free from that so that, yes, we'll experience it for a while in this life, but not forever because he has overcome that. That's the guy that wrote God is love. So somehow if we experience Jesus, we can experience God's love even though we can't fully understand God. Does that make sense? Did you say that again? You know I'm wrapping up, right? This is, this is important stuff, and we're going to pray one more time. If we focus then on Jesus, we can then connect with what Paul wrote and believe how, even though it's audacious for him to have said this, Paul said, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He does not say all things are good that happen. He says God's going to work them all for the good. So that friend of mine who had horrible things done to her as a little girl, who then wandered away from God, well, can you blame her? No, of course not. Because her testimony is, I prayed, God, make them stop. And God didn't send anybody in. I guarantee you that God was speaking to that guy. 
or to those people, stop, stop, stop. But he did it anyway. We identify with that to some extent, right? Has God told you not to do something and you did it anyway? Stop, don't do it, right? In little pieces, we understand that. And yet, her testimony is, when I started to experience Jesus and all that Jesus is and was and the way that Jesus suffers with me and was with me suffering because Jesus doesn't always take away the suffering, he overcomes the suffering, and Jesus, even on the cross, was willing to say, Father, forgive the people that put me up here to die. Jesus did that, right? He said, Father, forgive them. And he walked that road, and he suffered for the people. He, she said, as I, as I started to understand that Jesus, I started to realize, well, maybe God does love me. Maybe I am worth something. Maybe I'm not just worth something. Maybe I'm worth, like, even his son. Maybe he loves me so much that he then, if I could go back in time, he was suffering with me and present with me and wanted to help me to overcome that. And in the future, when I'm given a new body in the resurrection of the dead and I live forever, I'm not going to remember that. I'm not going to have those scars. I'm not going to have that pain. He's going to deliver me from that because the resurrection of Jesus shows that God can do that. And that's given her hope. Such hope that she's like, I want to tell other people about that Jesus. Now that does something to me. That does something to my heart. Because I'm like, wait a second. Then people will know that God is loving if God really helps them to understand Jesus and what Jesus did. So here's a little prayer that might help somebody here right this minute. Maybe the other one, you were like, wow, there's God's presence. Maybe for this one, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe God loves me that much. I'm going to read some things that are my speculations of if I were to then think about Jesus and pray to Jesus, here's, here are some things that mean a lot to me for me to remember, to remind me of how much God loves me in Jesus, okay? Let me lead you in prayer, if, if you're willing. If you're willing, just kind of think about Jesus. Jesus, send your spirit upon us as we think about what you have done for us and how much God loves us and how we can see that in what you did for us. So Jesus, what is it that you said to God the Father when you all talked about our human need for help? What did you say, Jesus? Jesus, why were you willing to come to earth as a little weak human baby who could be dropped, who could be abused, who, was, who had given up the power that you had in heaven? Jesus, why did you do that? Jesus, why were you willing to let people spit on you and nail you to a cross when you could have wiped them out with one word. Why were you willing to do that? Why? Why? Why were you willing to let humans strip you down, nail you to a cross, and make you suffer and suffocate and bleed? Why? Why didn't you save yourself? Why didn't you just say, forget humans, I'm out of here? Why? Why did you stay there? Why did you suffer for us? Why did you die for us? When you felt my guilt and my shame when you were on the cross, why didn't you just damn my soul to hell right there? Why, why did you want to forgive me? For every person that is here, when you felt the pain, when you felt the guilt, when you felt the shame, when you felt the despair, why didn't you come off the cross and say, enough, I don't want it anymore? Why did you stay there and die? If it was because you love us, you've got to convince us with your presence right now. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your love. Amen. And you have two prayers that you can pray yourself and that you can lead other people in. The prayer focusing on creation for folks that just need to know that God exists. We can't understand him, but he exists. God's there. God's present. God's mighty. God's bigger than any problems that you have. And then you have a prayer 
that you can experience yourself or you can lead somebody else in to understand how it is that we can believe that God loves us. That's because of Jesus. Amen? Amen.